with me, God. Thank you for the time away, and thank you for allowing me this time of rest. Um, I am privileged to introduce to you our speaker today. His name is Jared Walker, and I've known Jared for many, many years. My time of knowing Jared extends back to my time of undergrad school at Central Christian College of the Bible. Jared and I were freshmen together. And as I got to know Jared, I really got to uh, love Jared. He became a good friend. Uh, he was one who we all turned to because if you had a question about uh, the homework or anything in, in class, Jared was the guy who was going to have the answers. He was by far the smartest guy in our class. And uh, little did I know that our path would cross again. Uh, I attended his wedding. He married Joanne in 1997 and where he got married was the park here in Burnside, Illinois. And so we loaded up, Lindsay and I came and we attended that wedding in the park. Brad Fangman, I believe, was the one who came and con uh, conducted that ceremony. And then the reception was actually in the fellowship hall of Burnside Christian Church. So who knew that I had even visited Burnside long before I ever became uh, came on staff of Burnside. I'm not going to take any time this morning to tell any embarrassing or funny stories about Jared, even though I could. And I definitely am not going to tell you about the time that Jared uh, nearly kissed my then girlfriend, now wife, Lindsay, in the lobby of the Red Storm. I will let Jared tell you that story. Sorry. Uh, but Jared, I am delighted to be here. Thank you, my friend. Sorry, I missed you this time around. We will need to get together and do lunch sometime soon. But church, enjoy Jared Walker, smartest kid at, in my class at the College of the Bible. Would you please welcome Jared Walker? <laughs> I love how in the same introduction, Mark claims I was the smartest guy in the class, and yet from the back, I couldn't tell his girlfriend from mine in the <laughs> dorm lobby. They are both redheads, so. Well, it is good to be back here at Burnside. Man, one of, one of my fondest memories from Burnside is standing on this stage back in, I think, 1999, and the elders here ordained my dad and I into ministry. And I still have that ordination certificate on my wall. Signatures of people I love and uh, very much respect. Uh, Tony Newton's signature uh, on that. Dennis Pettit, his signature on that. Chris Reynolds as well. Um, just very fond memories of the impact that this church and you as the people of this church had on me as a young man uh, attending church here in the 90s. And to me, it's still a little weird when I pull up to the building and this building is here. Like this is still the new part of the building to me because uh, at the time that I went to college, this had not yet been built. We still worship uh, in the, the, what is now the, the fellowship hall. Well, now I get to work for a ministry called Christian Financial Resources. And CFR was started in 1980 in Florida. We were started to provide loans for growing churches. If you remember what interest rates were like in the early 80s, we think they've jumped really high now. But in the early 80s, if you had 12, maybe 14% on your mortgage, you held it because some people were paying 15 or 16% on their home mortgages in the early 80s. And so for churches trying to get loans, it was a tough, tough season. And so CFR was started as a nonprofit ministry to help Christian churches in Florida get loans. Well, in the 90s, a uh, rarely known fact, very brief period in CFR's history, we decided to expand outside of Illinois or out of Florida for the first time into Illinois. It was the late 90s. And the reason was CFR's founder, Bill Twadell Sr., his son, Bill Twadell Jr., had moved to Bowen, Illinois, and they decided they wanted to expand into Illinois. And so uh, it's a little bit of a jump from Florida to Illinois, but uh, one of the first loans that we did outside of Florida was New Community Christian Church. It was a church plant in Galesburg many years ago, and that was one of the first loans that we did outside of 
Florida. We decided we weren't quite ready to go national and so kind of focused again just on Florida. We did a couple other loans outside of Florida in the 90s, but then it wasn't until 2010 we decided to expand nationally again. And we now have uh, 11 of us all across the U.S. to represent CFR in our different regions. And today, other than Florida, Illinois is the largest state for us in terms of loan dollars that we have deployed. So we had it right that we should go to Illinois. We were just a little early uh, in, in doing that. Now, people sometimes ask, how are you able to fund loans to churches? We have grown over the years. We're nearly 900 million in assets. Uh, makes us larger than actually a lot of banks out there. How have we been able to grow and do all those loans to churches? Well, I joke that because we were founded near Orlando, we just reached out to Disney, we borrowed some magic, planted a few money trees, we can fund all the church loans that we want. It doesn't work that way, but our model is actually really simple. In Acts chapter 4, we read that there was no one in need among them in the early church. Why? They shared what they had. And that's how CFR works. We're able to make loans to churches because Christians and churches all across the country have invested at CFR. As families, as business owners, even churches have put dollars on deposit at CFR. And you can do that as well. In fact, there's a brochure like this. If you open it up, you'll see what's available uh, to invest at CFR. I tell our investors that it's good stewardship when you invest at CFR for two reasons. One is it's a good rate of return. We want to be good stewards and get a good rate of return. You can see that rate of return, whether it's ready access, you can withdraw any time, or a time certificate that you lock in uh, with a time commitment for a, a higher return. That's one dose of stewardship, that rate that you get. But the other is knowing that while it's with us, it's not being put in the stock market, it's not being invested places where maybe you don't know, you know that we're only using it to loan to churches across the US. So if you'd like to find out more, there's a table in the lobby. You can pick up a packet like this, has everything uh, you need. If you'd like to get started, happy to answer any questions. If you wanna leave my contact info, uh, happy to follow up. And I'm actually sticking around uh, tonight so I could connect with you this afternoon or tomorrow if you wanted to talk more about that. Well, for the next couple of moments, I, I do need to make a confession. I usually don't run my own clicker and I am terrible about remembering that it needs to be advanced. So if I get way behind, just wave your hands and I'll try to, try to catch up. But before we jump in any further, I want you to hear stories from a couple of people in their own words, letters that were written that then a, a couple of friends of mine recorded the audio for. Listen to these. my 
fourth college and I've changed my major like a hundred times. I know, what a loser, right? I see friends moving on with their careers, you know, becoming successful, the American dream, but I'm still here, lagging behind the rest of the pack. I'm not even sure if I want to catch up. I never knew my dad. He left when I was around three. My mom told me he was living in another state, but I never tried to get in touch with him. I don't really care, I guess. I know, I know it's somehow affected me, but I just, I just avoid thinking about it. My mom was great, and she did all she could to fill in her shoes. I just kind of wish I had that sort of father figure in my life to prepare me for this whole growing up deal. Having been under a hundred different majors, you probably could guess I've taken a lot of classes. I've taken philosophy, which taught me that life is meaningful only if you create meaning for yourself. I've taken biology, which taught me that I evolved by chance out of some primordial ooze. I've taken business courses, which assumed my only goal in life was to make money. A mistaken presumption for this coffee bistro. All of them led to my collective pile of knowledge. Yet none of them connected to anything meaningful in my life. Not once in all my education, not once has anyone asked me the question, why are you here? Why am I here? I guess that's the question I'm waiting for someone to answer. It's not that I'm in the worst place to be. I just can't get through one day without someone asking me what I want to be when I get done with school. <laughs> And that question pushes me into this, this loneliness where I feel like I'm, I'm huddled in a glass box that's only big enough for me. I guess I just wish I was something so I didn't have to become something. Stories of brokenness. Maybe you could write your own letter of a season when you felt like maybe you were at rock bottom, not sure where to turn, wondering where God was in the middle of it. Those letters were contained in the book by Rick McKinley, Jesus in the Margins. And I want to share another letter. This is from someone I know. She writes, I can remember being a shy, somewhat quiet teenager who didn't have a lot of confidence and didn't know the Lord. I ended up seeking love through giving in to my boyfriend and having sex. And the trouble was it didn't bring me the love I thought it would. And so I found myself a 17-year-old pregnant woman. I felt shame, loneliness, confusion. Most of all, I felt like my world was falling apart. I remember crying out to God, but I think I wondered if he would hear me because I knew I'd sinned. I think I would cry out to him with things like, why did this happen to me? I knew why, but I really didn't think it would happen to me. I remember pleading with God to remove the situation from me. I just couldn't seem to think straight. I was very emotional and panicking. You ever been at the spot where you were at the end of your rope and you, you cried out to God in total desperation, wondering if he even heard, and if he did hear, why wasn't he doing something? Well, if you can relate, you're not alone. Probably so, many of us in the room have letters like that that we could have written from seasons in our life, but we find examples of similar letters in Scripture. In fact, in the book of Psalms, we find examples of writers pouring out their heart before God about how they're feeling, how, how at the end of the rope that they are. And we find one example in Psalm 88, beginning in verse 1. We read, O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. See, I'm terrible at this. You know that I was not the smartest guy in my class. Um, yeah, I don't. If it depends on me, we're in trouble. All right. Verse 2. May my prayer, thank you. May my prayer come before you, turn your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me and hide my face from me? Hide your face from me. From my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. 
All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The, darkest, it, the darkness is my closest friends. A couple things that I uh, kind of respect about that psalm. First of all, how honest the writer is in expressing how he feels to God. I'm not sure I can pray like that. Like there's a little bit of me that's afraid that that's like disrespectful to talk to God like that. But apparently God's big enough that he can take it. But the second thing is the, the, the writer is so honest that he accuses God. You have taken all this from me, my friends. It's because of you that the darkness is my closest friend. And in some ways I'm almost jealous of that honesty. I want to be more like that in, in praying openly to God. And probably many of us have been there where we wanted to pray prayers like that. So why is it that we have those experiences? Why do we have these seasons where we feel like, God, this was not what I was signing up for when I said that I would follow you? Like I thought that if, if I did what you asked, that you were always going to be there and you were going to provide, and this doesn't seem like what I signed up for. Well, I want us to look at an example of somebody who maybe experienced that in the Bible. We're going to look at the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, we find what is often referred to as the call of Isaiah. When God asks him to become a prophet, basically God's mouthpiece to speak to the people of Israel on behalf of God, so it's a passage of Scripture that I've heard talked about in many Sunday school lessons and many sermons. And we often look at just the first part of the chapter. So we're going to look at that now, beginning in verse 1. In the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him there were seraphs, a kind of angel, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Side note, anybody have any angel figurines at home? Any of them look like this? I think we may have our image of angels a little short. But anyway, picking up in verse 3. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So Isaiah is saying, wait a minute, being your prophet means being your mouthpiece. I'm, how, how am I qualified? I have unclean lips. How am I qualified to speak for you, God? Verse 6, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Pretty cool passage. Almost every Sunday school lesson or sermon I've heard about the call of Isaiah, that's where we wrap up. We say, hey, this is pretty cool. Let's be like Isaiah. When God calls, let's answer, here am I, send me. A couple great things about that passage. First, we see the glory of God. In fact, in the Gospel of John, in the New Testament, we're told that Isaiah is actually seeing the glory of Jesus, the Messiah to come in this vision. We also have that whole symbolic lip cleansing thing with the coal that's pretty cool so that Isaiah's objection is overcome. His lips are now made clean so he can be God's mouthpiece. And then thirdly, it's almost a poetic answer that Isaiah gives when God says, whom shall we send and who will go for us? And he says, here am I, send me. And again, oftentimes we hear a sermon, a lesson taught, let's all be like Isaiah. We close our Bibles, we go home ready to answer the call. We don't look at what happens next. And all of a sudden things take a little bit of a different turn as we continue on in Isaiah 6. Verse 9. The Lord said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then Isaiah said, for how long, O Lord? And the Lord answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, 
until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. Okay, things take a little bit of a turn. Isaiah now finds out what he signed up for. And here's what he learns. Isaiah, you're going to speak, but people are not going to listen. Their hearts are going to be hard against your message. And then when Isaiah asks, how long is it going to be that way? The answer is, until everything is destroyed. Until the land's forsaken, people are carried off into captivity. Wow, that's going to be fun. Isaiah now finds out what he said yes to. And I have to, to wonder that there was a part of Isaiah that didn't want to ask, hey, hey Seraph, can, we just, can I get my dirty lips back and I'll just go home? Because I didn't realize that that was what I was saying yes to. Well, there's one more verse in this chapter. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. It starts out kind of similar in tone. doesn't sound good. Verse 13. And though a tenth remains in the land, though a tenth is spared from the destruction that's coming, guess what? It will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth, kind of tree, and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, here is the only phrase of hope in this chapter. So the holy seed will be the stump in the land. A holy seed. So this is the, the description that God uses for the people of Israel. That they are going to be like a forest that has been cut down. The only thing left is stumps. You been there? Thing after thing. Tragedy followed by financial trouble, followed by work difficulty. And, and you go to dig a little deeper and you realize you're, there's, there's no deeper to dig. There's nothing left. It's just a stump. I like how Eugene Peterson paraphrases Verse 13 in the message. The country will look like pine and oak forest with every tree cut down, every tree a stump, a huge field of stumps. But there's a holy seed in those stumps. And a seed means new life, growth. In fact, we understand this to be a prediction of Jesus, the Messiah, that yes, a season is coming for the nation of Israel when they are going to be reduced to stumps. But out of that will come the Savior that has been promised. Well, later in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah delivers a message to the, the people of Israel, but it's a little bit different than the tone here in Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 61, we find a message of renewal and hope, picking up in verse 1 of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, Isaiah writes, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair." They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. So Isaiah promises that a time of restoration is coming for the people of Israel. A time when their cities will be renewed, when those who mourn, they're going to be comforted. The brokenhearted, they're going to be healed. And again, God uses trees to describe the people of Israel, but this time, instead of being stumps, they're called oaks of righteousness. Let's connect these passages together a little bit more. God says in Isaiah 61, the people of Israel will be, be described as oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Where do those come from? Where do trees grow from? Where do plants grow from? A, a seed, right? In the case of an oak, it's an acorn. For Israel, where does the seed come from that God uses to grow them into oaks of righteousness? From the stump that remains in their season of destruction. 
Isaiah 6, 13, out of their stumps will come a holy seed. Now I'm about to do something that I have to give a disclaimer for. When Isaiah wrote this, he did not divide it into chapters and verses. So he didn't say, okay, that's the end of chapter 5. Now I'm going to start chapter 6. He didn't put the verse numbers. Those were added later so that I could say in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13, we read and we could all find the same verse. I still think this is kind of cool what I'm about to do though. So in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 13, out of their stumps will come a holy seed. If we move the colon to the right one place, Isaiah 6.13 becomes Isaiah 61.3, oaks of righteousness. The people of Israel will go from stumps to a holy seed that grows into an oak of righteousness. Friends, the question is not, are we going to face seasons of life where we feel like all we've got left is a stump? That there's nothing more to give. God, we've given you everything. We thought you were going to do your part. God, I've got nothing left. Those seasons are going to come. The question is, at that spot, do we say, God, that's it. I'm taking my stump and I'm going home. If this is how it's going to be, we're out. Or do we take the stump that is left, surrender it to God and say, God, I don't understand, but all that I have, just this stump that remains, I surrender it to you, hoping, praying, believing that out of my stump, you can draw a holy seed and grow it into an oak of righteousness. Which do we want to remain? A stump in a wasteland? Or do we want to allow God to, to do the work, sometimes hard work, of growing us into an oak of righteousness. We see it in the life of David in the Bible. He sinned terribly before God. It affected his family in horrible ways. His son died because of his sin. David probably felt like a stump. And yet we see God worked even in that season. And David still died described as a man after God's own heart. Mary found herself an unwed, pregnant teenage girl by God's design, and yet God did some amazing things through that. And it gives hope to me that in my seasons of brokenness, though I am broken, God's not done. That out of my stumps, God can bring a holy seed. Earlier you heard the letters from David and Jennifer, but it was only part of their story, part of their letters. Listen to the rest of their letters now. Knowing him, I realized the things that I kind of avoided before. I guess not having a dad was a pretty major deal for me. I stuffed it in for most of my life, but the effects were still there. For one thing, I wouldn't finish anything. I guess I was just really scared of him. But accepting God as my father has made a big impact on my life. Sometimes I still find myself wanting my real dad to have a relationship with me, but then I realized that's, it's like telling God he's second best. I don't normally wake up feeling like I'm God's son. I live with being alone for so long, so that doesn't come natural to me. But when I take time to really focus on what I believe, it all lines up. I might even go ahead and finish college. I just want to be able to say that I did it. I'm still kind of afraid, but don't worry. God's kicking me in the butt in that area. The truth is, I do feel accepted. I know God is there, that He wants me as a son. You know what? That's pretty cool. Now that Jesus is in my life, I really see things differently. I used to think that if my parents had never gotten divorced, then my life would have been perfect. I know now that is not the case. The thing I was really longing for was the love and security of my Heavenly Father, and it has made all the difference. I don't cling to thoughts of what should have been anymore. Instead, I focus on what is and will be as I live in the love of Jesus. Christmas and family gatherings are weird and can still dredge up the old pain. At those times, I'm tempted to run back into the place where I feel sorry for myself, but that's not where life is for me. Now life is in Christ and His love, and knowing that, the truest meaning of home is with God in my heart. In that place, I know I will not fall apart, and God is not going to leave. 
I'm going to keep believing and living in that love. I also had read part of a letter from someone I know. Here's the rest of that letter. Now looking back, I can see how God was at work even though I didn't know him. My older sister told my parents I was pregnant and they wanted to talk with me and my boyfriend. I can't remember all the things they said, but after our talking with them, we went for a drive and my boyfriend asked me to marry him. We were married in September of my senior year of high school. My parents helped us out so much when the baby came. We spent the first week at their home so I could learn how to take care of our baby. They also provided lunch for both my husband and me as I went back and finished high school. But most of all, my mom took care of our baby so I didn't have to worry about him while I was at school. God also brought people around us that knew the Lord and my husband and I were baptized into him on December 6th, 1980. God has changed our lives in so many ways. He gave me hope when I was hopeless. The odds were against us from the start, but God loves bringing beauty from ashes. The baby I was talking about is the man who's preaching to you today. This is my mom's letter. And I've preached this sermon or used this letter in dozens of churches across the Midwest. But today's the first time that she's been in the audience when I read it. And so I asked her permission to use it today. So mom and dad are in the audience, but you heard that my grandparents took care of me when I was a baby and they're in the audience today as well. Continuing with the letter, God has blessed me with a husband who's seeking to be like Christ, a son who's serving the Lord, a beautiful Christian daughter-in-law, and six wonderful grandchildren. All those grandchildren are my fault. I have six kids. <laughs> but the best blessing of all is eternal life through Christ Jesus. I've never regretted giving life to Jared. He has been a blessing in my life always. I'm pretty sure I can remember a couple stories. You weren't thinking that in the moment. But I thank God often for giving me such a precious gift and for his forgiveness and grace and mercy. Without him, I am nothing. My husband and I have learned how to pursue oneness and love each other more than either of us thought possible as we have grown in Christ. Now, this will give away my age, but I think back in September, September, mom and dad celebrated their 47th wedding anniversary. God's good. Well, right now, I'd like for you to make a commitment to God between you and him. You may be in a season of brokenness. You may be, okay, I didn't know how to describe it, but now I have a word for it. Stump. That's where I'm at. Just call me Stumpy, because that's the season of life I'm in. If you're at that spot, commit now to surrender all that stump to God. To surrender and ask Him to draw out of it a holy seed. And if you've been through a spot like that where you've seen God work in your brokenness, then commit to be willing to share that with others, just like David and Jennifer did, just like my mom did. Dave Gibbons, a pastor that I first heard talk about this holy seed uh, as such a message of hope, he said this, as we are honest with our pain while offering the hope we have, the holy seed is planted in people's hearts that can make a true difference. So be willing to share from your pain, from your own season of brokenness, so that God can plant holy seeds in the lives of others. Corey Ten Boom was a Holocaust survivor. She was sent to a Nazi prison camp because she and her father and her sister, uh, they hid Jewish families in their home above their watchmaking shop in Holland to help them escape from the Nazis. It was discovered. They were all put into prison camps. Corey's father and sister both died in camps. Corey survived. And one of her many famous quotes about her experience is this. When the train goes through a tunnel and the world gets dark, do you jump out? Of course not. You sit still and trust the engineer to get you through. We do not despair in our times of brokenness because out of our broken stumps, God can bring a holy seed. Folks, we may be broken, but God's 
not done.